Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopez, as always, and today I'm joined again by Dr. Glenn Gare. He's professor of psychology at the State University of New York at New Paltz. Uh, last time we talked about his most recent book, Positive Evolutionary Psychology, Darwin's Guide to Living a, a Richer Life. And today we're going to focus on a recent paper of his titled Politics and Academic Values in Higher Education. Just how much does political orientation drive the values of the ivory tower? So Dr. Gary, it's a pleasure to have you on the show again. Thank you. Oh, so happy to be back, Ricardo. Thank you for this invitation. Okay, great. So uh, let's start perhaps with some basics here. So in the paper, you explore different academic values. So academic rigor, academic freedom, student emotional well-being, social justice, and the advancement of knowledge. Uh, so is this uh, the complete set of uh, academic values that exist, or are there others and you simply picked these ones? And I mean, if you did that, why? Sure, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I guess the, the target of this discussion surrounds this paper um, that my students, several of my students and I published. But what's interesting about it is we self-published it. Now in academia, self-publishing your academic work is not exactly considered um, the highest caliber thing to do. And so I'm sure we'll get into the context and history of why we self-published this particular paper. But the paper was on, um, simply it boils down to academic values. What are the academic values held by professors within higher education? And <clears throat> as you're suggesting, Ricardo, there were five basic ones that we, that we focused on. Um, these being exactly like you said, knowledge advancement, um, student emotional report, uh, support, social justice, academic rigor, um, and, um, and academic, academic freedom. freedom. Academic yeah. freedom, yes. And so these, these are five academic values of, of many. Um, we certainly have, have heard people suggest, you know, why didn't you study X, Y, or Z, why didn't you study integration of knowledge as an example? Why didn't you study um, application of knowledge as an example? There are lots of values in, in higher education. I will tell you that this study was motivated by a specific event. And that specific event was a talk on our campus by Jonathan Haidt of NYU New York University, um, highly renowned behavioral scientist. And his talk focused on the question of whether academics can truly pursue social justice as an academic value and knowledge advancement or what he might have called truth seeking as an academic value. And that talk was very <clears throat> provocative. And this study was really designed to elaborate on a lot of the questions that my students and I started asking after that talk. So the two core academic values of these five that we studied were knowledge advancement and social justice. And then we kind of sat around the table and we thought about um, what are some of the other core academic values. And to, to be honest, you know, we came up with student emotional well-being, academic freedom and academic rigor, um, simply based on a conversation of students who'd you know, we're mostly graduate students and who'd been around academia for quite a while. Um, so this was partly rooted in these two basic values that Dr. Haidt talked about, and then partly, you know, my team's best guess, I'll put it that way. Right. But, but could you tell us back then, was Jonathan Haidt arguing that those two values he focused on were incompatible with one another or not? Yes, that is definitely the perspective that he presented. Um, and it was very interesting because I've, I've been someone who's thought quite a bit about politics in the academy for a lot of reasons over the years, partly being an evolutionary scientist or an evolutionary behavioral scientist. Um, people in, within academia don't necessarily like evolutionary psychology or evolutionary behavioral science, even though I love it. Um, 
But, you know, because of that, I have across my career going all the way back to 1994, when I first started teaching college, have run into all kinds of political resistance regarding evolutionary psychology. So I've been really interested in this topic. And when I heard Jonathan Haidt break this broader issue down into this question of, well, what is it? Are you looking to advance knowledge or are you looking to advance a social justice initiative? Because in his view, these are incompatible goals. Um, you know, to make a point, sometimes you state it perhaps a little more strongly than is needed. So I will say that he he has been criticized a bit for, for saying this, making this point in very categorical terms, perhaps a bit too strong. But the basic idea he's saying is that if, if you're trying to advance a social justice initiative and make it so that everyone has equal opportunity, everyone has equal resources, everyone has equal fiscal resources, um, and if and educated people should understand this and should think about and learn ways to advance that kind of initiative, that might not be compatible with certain things that you learn along the way. One example, um, he presented some very clear data in his presentation. And at some point, I'd like to sort of step back and talk about why the presentation took place on my campus and what the, the context was sure. for that. Um, but in his presentation, which was held at my campus at the State University of New York at New Paltz in fall 2016, um, he gave an example of women in science. And he showed the numbers of women who are choosing engineering majors and computer science majors and majors along those lines. And he, he kind of showed the, the presentation was um, the slide was half blacked out. And he essentially showed that women are going into those numbers at lower rates than are men. And everyone in the audience of, you know, hundreds of academics, you, you could tell were sort of angry or uncomfortable, or, you know, this is an injustice kind of thing. But then he presented, he kind of uncovered the other part of the slide and he presented data showing, well, what do you want to study? And he, sh he essentially showed that women don't want to study those fields at the same rate as men want to study them. Um, so in other words, the, he essentially presented, I think, very compelling evidence that women aren't in those scientific fields, not for lack of opportunities, but for lack of interest. I will tell you that I have a daughter um, who I think the world of, who's going into her senior year, um, Megan at the University of Richmond, she's studying political science and she was great in math and science when she was in high school. And I would have loved for her to have gone into biology or engineering or something like that. And I think that if I paid her a billion dollars, she would not have done it because she was going to follow her particular interest, which <clears throat> interestingly in the, ac in the academy is something that we like to enc generally encourage. Um, Males and females, boy and girl students, whatever you want to call them, they have different interests. Those interests come from a broad array of factors. And I don't think the point of this discussion is to figure out what those factors are. But this idea that it's differential opportunity is not correct. It, it's not correct because, A, there's lots of... Um, opportunities built into universities, built into organizations, built into all kinds of government uh, programs and systems to try to amplify women in the sciences. There's no programs designed to try to amplify men in the sciences. Um, and when you look at what people are interested in, it's not women, women are not, not going into these fields because of lack of opportunity. Opportunity. But a social justice initiative, if you put, you know, put on blinders and just say, we need to make this right, we need to make this fair, then you can't really see this other side, you know, you can't really see that other data, you can't really process that data and integrate it into this other initiative, because, you know, the, the initiative, if the initiative is just get more women into science, because that's more fair, um, then you're ignoring the data. 
So I think, I know there's a lot of examples I could give, but that's one example where understanding the reality of it leads to a very different understanding of the situation compared with just pushing a social justice initiative. So that's, that's the way that Jonathan Haidt presented it. And so our study was really designed to see, do academics really um, prioritize social justice over knowledge advancement? Um, and if so, who does more so? Um, who prioritizes the one, who prioritizes the other? And you know, what are the factors that really account for these outcomes? So that's what our study was really largely about. Mm -hmm. So uh, taking then a step back, as you suggested, why did this talk presentation happen uh, at your university? What were sort of the main vo motivations behind it? Yeah, th so thank you for, for allowing me to elaborate on that. Um, as you know, Ricardo, because um, I know that you're very brave and you talk to academics who have no problem speaking their minds and studying ideas that might be unpopular. I think that you've become famous rightfully for, for bra bravely kind of following that path. And as you know, um, we're kind of running into what some people are calling cancel culture. Mm -hmm. um, and the cancel culture idea, which I'll say is, is kind of concerning. It kind of says that, um, you know, a person can make one mistake or maybe two mistakes, I don't know, but a certain number of mistakes or cross a certain line. And then the answer is that person's dead to us. That person's work doesn't matter anymore. We can't watch that person's movies anymore. That person's jokes are no longer funny. Um, it's like that person's like dead to the world and to not treat the person that way is somehow um, is, is somehow politically incorrect. So we're running into a really disturbing um, trend regarding cancel culture. Now, that fact is completely amplified on college campuses. On college campuses in the United States, in Europe and, and other places with similar kinds of cultural values, modern modern cultural values, um, there is a strong tendency to discourage anything that feels or looks at all like conservative ideology or conservative thinking. Um, Jonathan Haidt in his presentation showed data suggesting that the proportion of academic faculty in the United States who identify as conservative 20 years ago was very low and now is very, very close to zero. Um, and so if you think about the importance of intellectual and ideological heterogeneity, the importance of multiple perspectives being out there, that's kind of problematic. So a few months back before Jonathan Haidt came to speak, our campus um, through student activities had invited two speakers, one was Cliff Kincaid, who's a sort of conservative pundit in the United States, has a blog, has um, maybe a podcast, says a bunch of stuff that, you know, liberal minded people tend to strongly disagree with and be offended by. And, and to be honest, there was another guy who he was gonna debate and no one even remembers the name of the other guy because the, the concern, the outrage that emerged was People had Googled Cliff Kincaid and do you know that he said this and do you know he said this and do you know he said this and how terrible and we can't allow this person on the campus, et cetera. And the event got canceled, right? So literally cancel culture, the, the event got canceled. And when the event got canceled, there was, ton, there was a lot of outrage kind of all over the place. And some of the outrage was from people like me. I, don't, I didn't know this guy at all. I'm sure he said some terrible things I would disagree with, but but a state university should so much be all about open expression of ideas. I truly, really, in my heart, believe that. Um, and the president of our university, Don Christian, was also kind of outraged, I think, at the cancellation because he had nothing to do with the cancellation of, of the event. He kind of found out the same way that I did, just the organizers canceled it and got the word out. And so Don Christian, the president of the university, put together a free speech task force and said, this is a problem and we need some mechanism for our, our campus to process this information, to think about and to address this 
this idea. So he put together a group of about six or seven of us. Um, and it's interesting, the faculty were, I would say <clears throat> one or two might identify as, as politically conservative, um, but mostly we were advocates of free speech. And that was definitely the, the angle, you know, so it was like not, no one on the group was saying, yes, let's let this guy with these opinions come here and say these things that most of us disagree with. What we were saying was, you know, freedom of speech and the expression of multiple perspectives is critical in an open university environment. So, um, so the president, fast forward a little bit, President Christian asked me to chair the committee. And you know me well enough, Ricardo, to know that, you know, if I think it's the right thing to do, I don't care. You know, I, I wasn't going to sit around and stay up at night and ask people, is this the right thing to do? You know, I stand for academic freedom. So I immediately said, sure, I'll, I'll do it. Um, and I did. And um, we had a small budget for our group and we were encouraged to get people, create some programming to get people to think about freedom of speech in the academy and then re-invite Cliff Kincaid at a later point, which we did. Um, and in between those events, we invited Jonathan Haidt to come and speak about this conflict between truth seeking and a social justice agenda. So this talk um, was kind of sandwiched in that particular context. So um, emotions were high. Our, the room we had his talk in accommodates over 200 people. It was standing room only. We had to stream it into the next room, which holds like 500 people. Um, the way <laughs> my friend, Pat Sullivan, um, who was actually on the, on the committee with me, she said, I've been here, she's been, she'd been there longer than I had. She said, I've been here for like 30 years. And she said, I've never seen an event that created such a ruckus. It was unbelievable, the pushback, the reaction. Um, and of course, I thought everything that Jonathan Haidt said made perfect sense. I didn't, I didn't hear any, there was a couple things, maybe I didn't agree with a thousand percent, but I was like, wow, this is, this is great. And I turned around after the talk and I feel like I saw like 300 really angry faces. And I was like, oh my God, I'm like, this was um, a much more controversial talk than I had anticipated or would have expected. And, and that's, that's when my research team and I kind of looked at that and said, wow, the, the issue of politics and academia, it's even worse than we had thought. Let's design a study to explore this further. So that's kind of the broader context. Okay, so let's follow the steps there. Uh, what, uh, how did you des design your study? What did you set out to study then? So the, this, the main thing, we had a lot of things we studied, but the main thing was we asked academics. So all of our participants were academics and we asked academics, how much do you value each of these five, each of these five, um, possible values. And again, academic rigor, academic freedom, social justice, student emotional well-being, and advancing knowledge. So on one hand, we wanted to see like, do professors really value social justice more than knowledge advancement? That was kind of question number one. Mm -hmm. Question number two had to do with, <clears throat> we figured different professors, some professors might value social justice more than advancing knowledge and vice versa. So we thought about what we would call in the behavioral sciences predictor variables. Um, one easy one we thought of was political orientation. We had this idea that maybe uh, faculty, almost all faculty are very liberal, but maybe faculty who identify as very, very, very liberal are more likely to prioritize social justice over these other values. Um, Number two, we thought field of study might matter. We thought of a simple example might be faculty who are in the humanities, um, history, English, this kind of thing, um, versus maybe what you might call the hard sciences like chemistry or physics, or maybe the school of business, right? Where Jonathan Haidt actually resides. You know, we thought maybe business faculty might really care very little about student emotional support and social justice relative to academic rigor and advancing knowledge. 
Um, and finally, we expected a gender effect. We expected, and, and again, this wasn't a judgmental study. We weren't trying to point fingers or say, aha, we just really wanted to understand this better. We thought that women might be more interested in emotional, student emotional well-being for a lot of reasons. Um, and we thought they might be more interested in social justice. If you look at voting patterns in the United States, you certainly see evidence of, of that. Um, and we thought that men might be more interested in knowledge advancement and academic rigor. That particular prediction, this gender-based prediction is very interesting, we thought, because if you look at the trends in faculty over the last several decades, higher education used to be just like so many industries, a, a, a male dominated business, right? right? This used to be like, you were gonna find the president was a guy with a suit, the provost was a guy with a suit, the deans were a bunch of guys with suits, department chairs were guys with suits. And I think a great thing about um, societal changes in the last several decades is a higher proportion of women going into higher education, higher proportion of women getting degrees. Turns out that when you give women opportunities to go to college, they're great at it. I will tell you at State University of New York at New Paltz where, where I teach, women have a much higher probability of getting into school. Women graduate in four years at a much higher rate than men do. Their GPA is higher at every single grade on average um, from first year to through senior year, they're more likely to win um, excellence awards than our males at the end of the academic year. They're more likely to get into a whole broad array of graduate programs. They're more likely, and nowadays um, that's, that fact has been going on for years and women are now also more likely to um, obtain academic positions and make it into the academy way higher rates than used to be the case. So we now have a situation where if there's a demographic variable that is changing the face of who's running universities, and if people with that particular demographic marker are more likely to value social justice and emotional well-being relative to knowledge advancement, this can help us understand why we're seeing some of the changes in the academy that we are seeing. So that was a, a very important um, factor of our study that we were exploring. Mm -hmm. And how do you look at the relationship between these different variables? I mean, political orientation, field of expertise, gender and personality, because particularly when it comes to gender, political orientation, personality, isn't it the case that they are sort of interrelated in the sense that there are uh, sex differences in personality that perhaps would influence political orientation and so on? So. Uh, how do you look at the relationship between them? Yeah, that's, that is a great question. Um, in the behavioral sciences, we use the phrase multicollinearity, and mm -hmm. multicollinearity exists when multiple predictor variables are positively related to one another. So women are more likely to identify as liberal than men are. Women are more likely to score higher on the personality dimension of agreeableness than men are. Men are more likely to be found in the school of business and in the department of physics and engineering than women are. So a lot of these, a lot of these variables are conflated, um, and we call that a, a case of multicollinearity. So we did. I'm looking actually at the the paper open in my in my other window, and we did analyses that take that into account. So in other words, we kind of looked at these effects given that we know those variables are interrelated, do these variables, like does gender predict the tendency to um, care about and to value student emotional well-being beyond, statistically beyond the effect of political liberalism and mm -hmm. academic field of study, as an example. The specific, there's different ways to do this statistically because of the design of our study. Um, we use something called an ANCOVA or an analysis of covariance. And what we found when we did this was field of study did not stand out as a significant 
predictor in and of itself. We didn't really have a large enough sample of people from all the different fields of study, but the other variables did, um, taking that multicollinearity into, into account. So political orientation remained a significant predictor um, such that liberal faculty were more likely to care about student emotional well-being and social justice. Conservative faculty were more likely to care about academic freedom and academic rigor. Um, and above and beyond that, women were more likely to care about student emotional well-being and social justice. And men were more likely to care about academic um, freedom and knowledge advancement and academic rigor. So that's a, that's a great question. And we, and we designed our study with statistics designed to exactly address that particular question. Mm -hmm. So could you tell us uh, why the study was self-published? Was there any <laughs> particular reason for that? Sure. Um, you know, I like to tell, to tell my students that every, every academic paper has the behind the scenes paper. And wow, what a, what a behind the scenes paper this one had. What's interesting to me um, is I've, you know, I've, I've been around, I'm, I'm not, not, I'm not a spring chicken anymore, Ricardo. Um, and I've been pretty productive. I have over a hundred academic publications to my name. Um, and, and I only say that I'm not, I'm not boasting. I don't really care. You know, I obviously I enjoy my work. I think that's pretty clear. But the reason I say that is because I have a I have a good sense of when something's publishable. Um, this particular study, you, there's a couple factors that make a study relatively publishable. This particular study had a non-college student sample. In the behavioral sciences, that's that's a point in your favor. That's always a point in your favor right off the bat. Um, this particular study used really solid statistics. Um, we presented the data in a very clear way. We used, in fact, we used a methodology um, called the budget allocation process. So instead of just asking people, how much do you value this, these things on a one to 10 scale, we use something much more sophisticated and, and statistically um, valid, methodologically valid that Norm Lee, um, a renowned psychologist came up with where he said, well, instead of just letting people say, I value all these, you know, we constrained, we said you have a hundred points and you have to divvy up these hundred points among these five different values. And that creates a much different dynamic where people are really forced to think carefully about differential values. So it's like, I care deeply about student emotional well-being, but do I care about it more than I care about academic rigor. So we, we used a, a system that was much more sophisticated than is usually used in this kind of research. Um, my student, Julie Planky, is an, an all-star statistician, and she wrote a, what I consider just a spot-on result section. Um, we did the right results. We took multicollinearity into account, as we were just talking about. It was written very tightly. We cited the newest research. It was about 30 pages, which is about spot on what you want for a manuscript. And, and another thing about this paper is it kind of was a psychology paper, but it was kind of a higher education paper. So we kind of figured we had two classes of journals that we could submit it to. And so for people who don't know, the academic publishing business is famously difficult and often unpleasant. Um, it includes something called blind review. Uh, on the surface, and even a little bit below the surface, I'd say blind review is a good idea because if the person reviewing my paper doesn't reveal their name, then I'm not going to come after them later. Like, I don't know what I would do. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm probably not going to chase them down. Um, but it's, it's a way to allow people to sort of encourage people to be honest Right. And it's a way to sort of avoid people from having long standing fights with each other, which happens too much in academia as it is. So so blind review has a lot of merit to it, but it also and we know this in social psychology very well, it encourages a certain kind of nasty behavior. Um, all the research on anonymous 
conditions, um, going back to research by Phil Zimbardo, famous social psychologist, shows that if you want people to behave in an antisocial and nasty way, then have them be anonymous because anonymity breeds antisocial behavior. And so the um, standard review process for academic publishing is anonymous. And, you know, so, so it's, it's a little bit problematic off the bat. Now, in this paper, we're criticizing, we're, we could be seen as criticizing academia writ large in sort of a very big way. We're kind of saying that academics know they should be focused on advancing knowledge because that's kind of what academia means. That's kind of like the obviously core value of the university. And we're kind of showing that that's not really what everyone does. I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. Um, in my job, my main thing is working with students and does, um, does supporting them emotionally matter to me? You bet, man, I don't, you know, I want the best for my students. I will spend hours and hours working with my students as much as I can. So, you know, this was hardly designed to say, you know, you idiots or anything like that. It was really just a description. And especially with a higher proportion of academics being women and with women being much more likely than men to value social justice and student emotional well-being, we're looking, this study I think is really important because it looks really clear, clearly at what are the effects of this changing demographic in higher education. We're not being judgmental. We're not saying good or bad. We're just kind of saying, here's, here's what it looks like. Um, some people took it as critical of the academy and because of that, didn't like it. And to be honest, Jonathan Haidt is a very renowned um, academic and hugely successful, but not everyone loves him um, because he's been very outspoken about these particular issues. He's been a very outspoken critic as head of the Heterodox Academy or as founder of the Heterodox Academy. Um, he's, he's run into a lot of criticism. I, I applaud him. I think he's very brave. I think he doesn't care. Um, he doesn't let it get to him, but, but he's been criticized. And this paper was explicitly rooted in his ideas. And so I think that was, you know, if 90% of academics who are reviewing this don't like his ideas, that was going to be problematic. So, so we kind of knew that it was going to be a little bit tough politically to publish, but what we ran into was almost comical. Um, so I had my student, Jacqueline DeSanto. Jacqueline is someone I've worked with for years. She got her master's degree with me. She and I have co-published a bunch of academic stuff. And I said, Jacqueline, here's a task for you. You're one of the co-authors on this. Why don't you be the one I call it the quarterback? Why don't you get this published? Um, here's a list of journals in order. Here's some higher education journals. Here are some psychology journals. Here's, you know, two or three of each. Submit it to this one. Then this one, we came up with like an order. And she came up to me maybe a couple months later and she said, Glenn, I got some bad news for you. And I'm like, well, go ahead. I'm, I'm an academia. I'm used to bad news. Let's hear what you got. And she says, well, several of the journals gave this what is called a desk reject. I will tell you that I never even heard of a desk reject until this particular manuscript. A desk reject is when the editor looks at it and says, I'm not even going to send it out for review. I'm unilaterally and personally going to reject it now. And the rejections never said anything about the politics. They didn't say, we don't like your message. We don't like the politics. We don't like the idea. They said things like you didn't have enough participants across the different fields of study. That was, which is, you know, we kind of acknowledged that and, and found a whole bunch of other stuff. So I didn't think that was going to be a deal killer. Um, they said things like, um, yeah, there was the small N for the different, the different groups. That was the one thing that people said. They said this wasn't very important. Some of these ideas aren't very important. Like it was like no one said we don't like the message. We don't like the politics. So there's a really weird thing going on where like it's like an elephant in the room kind of thing. So it got several desk rejects, which I like I said, I'd never heard of before. It went out to review for we might have tried over several years 
this paper, this research started in 2016. So we're now five years later, there's been a full pandemic since, you know, on top of all kinds of other stuff um, since we started. And after about 10 rejections, I talked to Jacqueline and other members of my team. And I said, I don't, I don't think we're going to get this thing published. I think that we could send this to the worst journal in the, in the world. And they're going to come up with some reason to not publish it. I think that this is seen as too threatening to academics. And I didn't real I knew it would be somewhat threatening, or at least, at least I thought of it as more provocative, like, you know, something to think about. Um, but people really, really obviously didn't like it. So after it got rejected by about 10 journals, my team and I said, forget it. We're just going to do something I've never, ever done before in this modern day and age. I'm going to make a nice looking PDF. I'm going to slap it onto Google Drive with public access. I write for Psychology Today, as you know. And so I wrote a Psychology Today article exposing this entire story, linking to this. And I will tell you that for a non-published paper, this might be one of my most highly read uh, papers I've ever actually had. So there's some, there's some great irony there as well. Yeah, so I mean, going back to the content of the paper and taking into account all of these factors, political orientation, gender, personality, and so on, and the, type, and the kinds of impact they might have on knowledge production in academia, uh, I mean, do you have any suggestions of how to deal with it? How to deal with these issues? Mm -hmm. It's a very good question. I think it's a, I think it's a really good question. I think that this, I think this information ought to be out there. I think that academics, especially maybe newer academics, should be made aware. Like if you're putting together a syllabus and you've never put together a syllabus before, you should probably realize that you should think about your values. You know, what are your values? Is knowledge advancement your primary value? Um, is the goal of your university about knowledge advancement? If so, then you ought to make sure that that is necessarily built into the design of your class. Is emotional well-being of your students an important value to you? How can you integrate that value into your syllabus without taking away from academic rigor, without taking away from knowledge advancement. Um, so I feel like there's a lot of meta education that professors could benefit from. I feel like this, the, you know, there could almost be an entire workshop that could follow from this. And again, not one that's politically charged, not one that's saying, aha, look at, look at you fools, but one that really says, these are the values we have. We all care about all five of these things, maybe just in different ways and different levels. Um, and we need to design our classes and implement our classes and knowing that there are these different goals. Some of them are kind of incompatible with one another. That is wicked useful. Um, so, you know, I've taught, I can't count the number of sections that I have taught over the years and I'm constantly, like I always tell my students, I say, here's the grading system. I, and I'm proud of this. I said, since 1994, I've never ever made an exception to the grading system in my syllabus, zero times. I said, I, I'm hoping to go to my grave saying that that is true. I don't say that to be a jerk. I say that because if I'm a student, I'm like, then I'm gonna read this syllabus and I'm gonna follow this syllabus and I'm gonna take this man at his word. Um, but within, with that understanding, you know, and I like to design the grading and the assignments and everything to really build knowledge in what I think is the most integrative and powerful way that I can do within the confines of the class. I have, an, I have a statement at the end that says, at the end of the day, I understand that we're all humans and I really care about you and I really want to help you. So what I do for the emotional well-being component, for instance, is we're supposed to have four hours of office hours a week. I have six hours of office hours a week. And a lot of professors say students never come to my office hours. And that's never true for me. My office hours are flooded because I tell my students, I say, look, I'm gonna make this as rigorous as I humanly can, but I care about you so much and want to work as closely with you in, a, in as supportive a way as possible to really help you, you know, 
achieve the goals of this class, but also achieve the broader goals that you're here for. Um, so I, I feel like we all care, all academics care about these five values in some capacity or another. And I think that having a meta understanding of these and thinking about given how I teach, how can I best integrate the ones, especially the ones that I really care about in a way that I'm not selling myself, not, you know, that I'm not compromising my goals. I'm, I don't want to compromise advancing knowledge. I never want to comp compromise advancing knowledge, but I also want to care about my students' emotional well-being. And to be honest, I, I, I'm sympathetic to social justice. Um, I can totally fully understand why that is a goal that we should at the very least have people learn about and, and think about in a very substantial way. Okay, so uh, let me ask you a more specific question. When sure. it comes to political orientation, as you said earlier, uh, we have this issue in academia that the vast majority of people there, uh, I mean, researchers, professors, are liberals or fall on the liberal side of the political spectrum uh, right. as opposed to conservative. So is that itself a problem? I mean, do you think that we would need to have more conservative students, conservative faculty uh, in academia? Or do you think that, for example, one example that comes to mind, I read a study that was published back, I think, in 2007 or 2009, authored by Joshua Tiber and Jeffrey Miller, where they looked into the political orientation of people in your own field, evolutionary psychology, because, uh, I mean, uh, since evolutionary psychology deals with basically the biological foundations of human behavior, people tend to think that researchers in the field would be more uh, uh, conservative, more right-wing oriented. And that's not really the case. Mo the vast majority of you are liberal. So, I mean, do you think that just being aware of perhaps the ways that your own political orientation might bias your research is enough for people to deal with these sort of issues or that uh, there should be some specific, I don't know, policies promoting more uh, conservatism in academia? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. There's, there's a lot there, Ricardo, so I'll, I'll try to unpack the different elements sure. of it. Um, you know, I, I think that understanding bias is pivotal. It's absolutely essential. Every single human scholar and scientist is filled with bias. I have my take on the world. I have my take on how I want the world to be. I have my take on outcomes that I want to achieve for myself, for the people around me, for my research findings. Um, when you come up with a hypothesis, it's a prediction that you have about the world. It's it's a bet, it's almost like a bet that you're making. Oh, I think that this is going to be the case. And if you've ever played poker and you make a, a bet, I play poker every Tuesday with this group of guys. And if I bet my dollar and I lose, it is a bad feeling. And if you are doing a study and you have a research hypothesis and you look at, you hit the button for SPSS, your statistical software and you're wrong, it's the same as like losing at poker. We're humans and it feels bad. I've been around the block a lot and I always tell my students, I said, that is the modal or most common outcome and you have to get used to it. Um, that's how science progresses. If we were usually right or almost always right in our hypotheses, we wouldn't even need to design studies and implement them, right? We could just say, well, I'm, I'm probably right because I'm usually right. Um, so you really need very thick skin. You really need to be able to, to look yourself in the eye and say, I was incorrect. Um, my hypothesis was wrong. That's a very important thing that, that you have to be able to say. Um, and being aware of your own biases. So like with these academic values that we studied in this particular study, like if you care so much about social justice, which a lot of my friends do, I'd say in a lot of ways that I do, a lot of the people in my social world do, that's okay, but realize it. Realize it so when you're doing research, 
say, okay, am, am I interpreting these data in an objective way or am I filtering them through this lens of social justice is the only thing that matters, right? Am I letting my own biases affect the way that I'm interpreting the data? And it's a very, very hard thing to do, but I think that level of understanding is really, really important to realize you know, we learn in research methods in the behavioral sciences, we learn that researchers have biases, but we don't really have a section of that course, which is about well, what are your biases and, and how are they affecting your interpretation of your data and your results? Um, and again, I can almost imagine, imagine like a workshop on that. It would be very easy to design a whole bunch of things where, where there was a finding that the data weren't really that great, but was totally consistent with something you wanted to believe. Because whenever we set things up like that, people always say, yeah, the data were strong. But if it's data that are kind of weak and it's inconsistent with what you want to believe, then you point out all the holes in the data, right? That's a very famous um, phenomenon about people. So that's kind of one part of your question. Another part of your question is a little bit more complex, and it has to do with political ideological diversity within the academy. Mm -hmm. um, across time, the academy has become more and more um, ideologically liberal. And that trend, when you look at the trend, it's, it's, not, it's not changing anytime soon. Um, I have some friends who have argued regarding that data. They'll say, well, that's because the liberal view is the correct view. And the educated people know the correct view because they're educated. And that's, I don't really know what to make of that. I don't, it's hard for me to fully agree with that, to be honest. Um, I know a lot of people who identify as, as conservative that are wicked smart, that have very high level, sophisticated understanding of social issues. Um, you know, there's, there, uh, just like there's different kinds of liberals, there's different kinds of conservatives. You know, not every conservative is wearing a red Trump hat and, and thinks he's still the president. You know, that's that's not, that's a lot of liberals think that's like 90% of the conservatives, but it's not, you know, it's not. There's a lot of um, conservative intellectuals actually that are super smart and that I have a lot to learn from and that we all have a lot to learn from. Um, so as political diversity decreases within the academy, what happens is people are, you know, we're educating these people and then they come out and then they run into a world that's very mismatched from where they were educated. So it's like, wait a minute, you know, I was surrounded by these hundreds of faculty that seemed really smart and to know, you know, what was right. And they all believe this stuff, but now I'm out in the real world and you all believe this other stuff. Um, are we preparing people appropriately for the real world by surrounding them by a single monolithic narrative? Um, I think that's problematic. I think that's problematic. I don't think that we should have affirmative action for conservatives as an example. I know that's a pretty extreme way to think about it. Um, I don't think political orientation should ever be considered in hiring decisions. And in fact, I think that um, universities should have in their hiring statements that political orientation is not considered, is not a, considered a, a criterion by which to, to make hiring decisions. Um, you know, but, but we know that when you have a whole bunch of people with one political ideology who really want to advance that ideology, this kind of thing happens implicitly. You know, we can call this implicit bias and there's various terms that it that it goes by. And it's concerning, you know, it's, it's concerning. Um, and the idea that there's lots of different versions of liberal ideology as well. You know, there's like in academia, if your politics generally align with a pol liberal political platform, but you are an, a staunch advocate of free speech and academic freedom within the academy, you're not really considered a progressive or a liberal. It's very interesting, whereas you would be in other kinds of contexts. Um, so I do think that this sort of move toward a monolithic ideology, a monolithic narrative, a narrative that's almost considered as an orthodoxy, almost considered as like a set of religious ideas that are considered the right ideas and that are true, 
I think that's that's wicked scary, to be honest, Ricardo. I think that it discourages independent thought. I think that it discourages the tendency to try to find conflicting information so that you can sort of learn and see multiple angles and multiple perspectives on issues. Um, I think it is definitely a fair characterization of a lot of what we see in academia these days. And I feel like um, different efforts like your, I think your program is one strong effort. I think efforts to try to get people to open their minds and to understand the multifaceted nature of understanding the world and the human experience. I and mean, then it's not, everything doesn't fit in with this one, this one narrative that seems to be so dominant these days. I think that that's a really important um, kind of thing at this particular juncture in, in history. Yeah, and this perhaps will be my final question, but uh, considering, uh, I'm not sure if this is completely true or not, but just for the sake of the argument, considering the possibility that maybe one of the reasons why we don't have as many conservatives in academia as liberals would be perhaps the fact that due to certain aspects of, of their political orientation, they wouldn't be as interested in academic uh, jobs or in the topics that are, are explored in academia, intellectual topics generally, uh, as liberals. So, uh, I mean, uh, one of the reasons why in my previous question I mentioned that paper, that study on the political orientation of evolutionary psychologists was that I was trying to put forth the point that perhaps uh, even though you tend to be liberal, I mean, to deal with the sorts of questions you deal with the evolutionary basis of uh, human psychology and uh, questions that liberals, I mean, they deal with them uh, politically in different ways, like for example, sex differences is a big one. Uh, that perhaps through your training, you were in a way, way able to overcome the biases you tend to have due to your political orientation. So I was wondering if that, uh, I mean, that sort of training or that sort of awareness of those biases would be enough to counter the more pernicious aspects or, or of the values that derive from the political orientation of people in academia? Yeah, it's a really, it's a really good question. I think that the whole thing about evolutionary psychologists generally being relatively liberal, um, I know the paper you're talking about um, yeah. first authored, I think by Josh Tyburn in about mm -hmm. 2007. Yeah. Um, it's eye opening. It's eye opening to a lot of people. Um, I think that was a very, a very important publication. And I think that in the case of evolutionary psychologists, I think that you have people that identify generally as politically liberal, partly because they're generally academics, but they're studying things that are considered politically incorrect and for some reason are considered politically conservative. Um, so here's, here's, an, here's an interesting example. There's a study by a guy named Schwartz. Um, and I think it was published in 2012, perhaps. And what he did was he presented a bunch of findings um, from evolutionary psychology, largely about male-female differences. So men care more about physical attractiveness than, than do women. Women care more about status in a partner than males do, these kinds of things presented these to two kinds of people, Christian religious people and non-religious people, and presented these either as this is information from evolution, something called evolutionary psychology, or just here are some facts. And what they found was that when it was devoid of the word evolutionary psychology, the Christians believed all of it. They said, oh, yeah, yeah, that's that all that sounds true. But when the phrase evolution got in the way, when that was slapped on there, they believed none of it. And the other group believed it more. It was unbelievable. Um, so evolutionary psychology has its own very unique PR stuff going on. Um, 
from the sort of liberal left, there's this criticism of, you know, you're saying men and women are naturally different. That somehow is an, an evil thing that we need to, to fight to the death. Um, within the academy and then from the other side it's like wait a minute you use the word evolution and you're like your your tagline you know I'm going to dismiss you in, entirely so um, being someone who's labeled himself as an evolutionary psychologist for decades now man I've seen it all I'll, I'll tell you that I definitely have um, you know to, to to I guess to sort of wrap things up getting politics out of science, getting politics out of academia as much as we humanly can will benefit all of us. I truly, genuinely believe that. I'm part of a group now um, and we're gonna launch pretty soon and have a conference I think next, next summer and we're called the Society for Open Inquiry in the Behavioral Sciences. And the idea of open inquiry is really designed to be completely devoid of politics. We're not saying, we're a little bit different than the heterodox movement. The heterodox movement says that we need to sort of include all the different political voices. Open inquiry says, we don't really care about your political voices. We're, we're kind of saying this is science and science should be about open inquiry. If there's a question that is of interest that can help us understand the world better, can help us understand the human experience better, then we should not provide barriers to asking that question because that's gonna provide barriers to us understanding things about ourselves. Do we sometimes in research learn things about ourselves that we don't like? Yeah, absolutely. I'll give you like one specific example. Um, famous finding, Daly and Wilson, two famous evolutionary psychologists who studied homicide. They found that in an analysis of thousands of homicides in Detroit, and Toronto in the 1980s. So this is relatively, you know, North America, relatively recent data. A third, one third of homicides had something to do with infidelity. That's step back. That hurts, man. What is that saying? That That is a harsh, dark fact of the human experience. If those faculty were told, well, you can't study that. We don't want to know that. You know, let's let's take anything about infidelity or homicide or, you know, that's a bunch of ugly stuff. Why don't you study butterflies or something nice like that? You know, but but because of academic freedom, they had that question. That question was rooted in the evolutionary perspective. It was open inquiry, I think, at its you know clearest sense. And they found something that is incredible incredibly critical and relevant regarding the human experience. It's dark, it's unpleasant, and it's true. And that's what we need to do with our behavioral science. Yeah. Okay, so let's end on that note. Uh, where can people find your work on the internet, Dr. Gear? Um, so I do have a website, which is simply my name, glengare.com, and I do write for Psychology Today, um, Darwin's Subterranean um, gosh, what is the name of it? Darwin's Subterranean World um, for Psychology Today. I have a lot of fun. I've written over 400 pieces. I often am writing about politics and science and, and evolution and psychology. And uh, you can certainly always look me up and, and email me. And uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to my ideas. No, it was my pleasure. And I hope to have you again somewhere in the, uh, in the future again on the show. That sounds great. Thanks so much for having me, Ricardo. Great to see you. Hi guys, thank you for watching this episode until the end. The channel depends on your support to keep running and so I would like to ask you to please pay a visit to my pretty page and consider making a pledge there. Any amount, even just one dollar, would already be a great help. You also have links to PayPal in the description box of the interview and otherwise and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like, comment and subscribe to the channel. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, and Blanchett, Pereira, Larson, Laguerrero, Francis Ford, Ernst, Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Alan, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Erica Lenny, John Connors, Paulina Barron, 
Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Vosbo, Weingard, Rebecca Newberger, Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Nassio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Colomba, Jorge Pinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Plyf, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Hugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omar E. Hickson, Fergal Kassen, Evan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslam Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Ian Solon, Roman Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazewski, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Elman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Saima Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, My Producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafini, Kian Gilligan, Sérgio Quadriano, Luis Caetano, Tom Venegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardas France, and Niruban Balachandran, and my executive producers, Michel Rogieski, Rosie, James Pratt, and Matthew Lavender. Thank you for all.